Yeah, so uh, welcome all to my talk. Um, so what we're going to talk about is a little bit what the fundamentals of what I see a customer. I work with Confluent Professional Services and we have a lot of customers getting their Kafka streams up ready, what they need to know because they, before they can move to production. So it's going to be a little bit like hands-on tips, but actually a big part of the talk is going to be, I would say, Kafka streams architecture fundamentals, because if you don't have the architecture right, if you don't understand how Kafka Streams works internally, monitoring it, scaling it, it's going to be pretty difficult because we don't know what we're actually doing. So let's jump right in with a quick introduction to Kafka Streams. Maybe a quick show of hands. Uh, who has used Kafka Streams already? Okay, and really production ready or more like developer interest, played around with it? Who has something running in prod? Okay, so this is, okay. Some slideshow of hands, that's good, okay. So first of all, what's Kafka Streams? Well, I think already in this conference, we talked about Kafka. Uh, yesterday, we had a nice introduction to the Kafka Producer and Consumer API, and actually Kafka Streams. So it is another API, part of open source Apache Kafka, which is more abstract, so to say, no? um, or more abstract level than the uh, Producer and Consumer. So it's somehow, for me, it fits snugly between Producer and Consumer, where we deal with individual records, and uh, the KSQL DB maybe, you know, where we use an SQL-like dialect to write our stream processing applications. So, so in one hand, you could say, okay, it's on level of abstraction, it is similar maybe to Kafka Connect. So I think, are you familiar with Kafka Connect a little bit? Yeah, also some show of hands. No, so Kafka Connect is basically a framework which allows us to run plugins, so-called connectors, <laughs> to interface with external data systems. Well, we can get data in, out of, into Kafka and out of Kafka. Um, for instance, Debezium is an example of a Kafka connector. And how we envision that uh, one might write a modern Kafka-based ETL pipeline is well to use as extract, uh, ex abstract means as possible. So maybe we use Kafka connectors to get the data in and out, and then, so to say, to transform the data from Kafka to Kafka, so from a Kafka topic to a Kafka topic, we might use Kafka Streams there. No? So Kafka Streams is not meant to really interface with external systems. One can do that, but I would almost consider that to be an anti-pattern. Good, so very important thing, if you're used to something like Spark or Flink, is that Kafka Streams is actually a Java library. It is not a complete framework. No, we can basically get along with that because we integrate very tightly with um, Kafka. No, we don't try to work with some other stream processing layer, we just work with Kafka. And there we can basically save a little bit on well, the whole framework platform thing. So I think another common misconception is that Kafka Streams is somehow running on the brokers. This is also not true. No, so it's a separate Java application which you compile using the library. You can run everywhere, basically. Um, no, bare metal, VMs, Kubernetes. Uh, but not on the Kafka brokers, typically. I mean, of course, you could deploy it there, but again, that would be kind of an anti-pattern. That also allows us to basically use any Kafka service, right? So if, if you have a, you know, a fully managed Kafka installation, either provided by you in-house, you know, or maybe from Ivan, maybe from Confluent, you know, and we could just write a, a small app, maybe we dockerize it, put it into a container, and it can work with this Kafka installation out of the box, so to say. We just have to point to the right bootstrap server. So how can we how can we get along, so to say, with not being a framework? Well, we heavily leverage the Kafka Consumer Group Protocol. This is actually an abstract protocol which can be used to assign resources to clients. And of course, for the normal plain vanilla consumer, we assign partitions to consumer instances. And here in, inside Kafka Streams, we use it slightly more sophisticated. I didn't put a link here, but there's a very good um, talk by um, Grant Shapira on Strange Loop a couple of years ago, who actually explains the Kafka Consumer Protocol pretty well. And also, this, this approach allows us basically to scale out our uh, Kafka Streams application. So, what is a Kafka Stream? No, so basically, I think as in many stream processing frameworks, a stream is supposed to be like an unbounded sequence of records. Um, and similar to maybe Spark and Flink, here it's also key value, so to say, right? No, think about Kafka records, basically. Um, 
So how, how do we program with Kafka streams? Well, basically, it's a we have two APIs in there, the so-called DSL um, and the processor API, or PAPI. We're going to focus on the DSL today. And what you do there is you basically build up a data flow graph, which we call topology. So in this respect, it's very similar to Apache Spark. Um, and then, basically, what is the semantics, so to say? Well, here we have this data flow graph with two input processors. Think about it. two topics which we read from. And then the semantic is basically one record at a time. I think this is similar to Flink, but I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Uh, no, so we, we basically pick one record. It flows through the topology um, you know, based on well, the logic we implement. It might have some effect, update some state, being output to one or, the, or another topic. And then the next record based on on one hand offset, on the other hand the timestamp from another input topic also flows through the topology. And I mean, of course, call me biased, but I think this is a very, very simple semantics to reason about. I feel this is more, sim more simpler than micro batch, want to think about, but uh, maybe your opinion differs. No, we can discuss later. Good, so maybe to have a quick look, how does it look like, right, this declarative API? No? So here we have the simplest Kafka Streams application we can think of, really. Um, no? So we open up stream, a topic called input topic as a stream. We apply some fancy business value using a map. So one input record becomes one output record, and we output it to another topic called the output topic. So one thing we have to make ourselves clear about is this distinction between stateful and stateless stream processing. And I like to uh, illustrate this a little bit with this quote, I think from Eleanor Roosevelt or Master Ugwe from the Kung Fu Panda, no, depending on you know your cultural background, maybe. No, so yesterday is, uh, is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. So stateless, what does it mean? Well, today is all that's given, it's a gift, right? So when we do a stateless processing, remember Kafka streams, we look at these records, for instance, the apology, we just look at the record we are processing right now. Right? So our output record only depend or should only depend on this one input record. So when we are stateful, basically, we also say, OK, no? we want to include our history. So our output record should depend on the input record and some aggregated view of all the history we have seen so far in our topology. And of course, it's our job as developers to basically define how this aggregated view is built and also this relationship between history and our current uh, record. And then finally, tomorrow is still a mystery. So we have in Kafka streams what we call an eager processing semantics. Right? As soon as we see this record, we output something. Right? There is no micro-batching, so to say. Oh. So there are some ways around it, but I think this is a little bit advanced. So quick overview, which kind of operations we have. I think everybody who knows some functional programming language might feel familiar here, or who knows Spark and Flink. We have filter, filter not, branch, split. We have map values, flat map values. No, so this is pretty much looks a lot like Spark, so to say. No? Um, we also have group and group by key. So how do our stateful operations look like? Well, there we have joins, where we can join either a table, no, some special type of stream or uh, two, cuff, two streams, or we can aggregate data. No? Either very simple, by just counting the values per key, or by providing more complex aggregation logic. And then we also have this even more advanced thing called the processor API. Good. So I think one very important tool is being able to visualize the topology. And for this, we have a two-step approach. On one hand, we can call topology.visualize, uh, dot describe, sorry, and this is going to give us a texture representation of the topology, which is kind of hard to read. And then there's this cool tool here, which you can find on the internet, which is taking this textual description, you copy it into a box, and you get out this nice painting here. So maybe have a, let's have a very quick example. Now the hello world of Kafka streams, the word count. Uh, so, okay, uh, big data. What, what can I say? So we open up a topic we, you know, of, well, sentences, so to say. We split it you know, into simpler words. Then we select the key to be the word. We do a group by. We do a count, right? So we count how often we say every word. And then we 
do it to a stream again and output to a topic, so to say. No? And formatting it nicely so we can actually see the key and the count together. And if we look at the topology which we get, it looks pretty complex, right, already. Let's have a closer look. So, closer look first. We actually see here what we call a state store, what this is for. Well, this is a stateful operation. I want to count a word. So, when I see a word as my input record, I have to somehow remember um, how often I've seen this word before. Now, for this one, Kafka Streams makes use of a concept called a state store. Huh? What are state stores? Well, actually, inside Kafka Streams, state stores are kind of two-level um, concepts, so to say. On one hand, we have a local RocksDB instance, so a key value store, which just maps well, key to value, so to say. So really, I think as a local cache. Now, similar to Flink, we try to keep this as close to the compute as possible. So this is going to run on the, inside the, well, on the same J machine as the Java JVM is going to run. Now, this can give us some problems with fault tolerance, because what happens when we m lose this machine? So other frameworks now use then snapshots, which take this local store and put it somewhere. Well, we use Kafka for that. Right? So we basically, we take our state updates and also store it in the Kafka topic called the change log topic. Uh, so basically, our state is always stored on, on two levels, right? One time local as a key value store in the compute node, and one time in the Kafka topic. So what does it give us? Well, suppose our application somehow fails over, right? Our first instance. No? The hard drive crashes, so basically our state is lost, which can be computationally intensive to get back. But we still have the state and the change log topic. So if we bring up a new instance, what it's going to do, it's going to look at this change log topic, read, read it from beginning to the end, and use, by this building up its local state store. And once it's finished reading up, uh, the whole change log topic, it can continue to process messages. So, closer leg two. If you actually look closely here, you can see our topology is now split in two. We have two subtopologies. Why is that? And we can actually see it looks a little bit like we have a, another topic here, there. So, to understand why this is happening, um, we have to look a little bit at or the Kafka Streams architecture. What are partitions in Kafka, tasks, and streaming threads? And this is really the last part of the intro, I promise. So, the way Kafka Streams works is we have so-called task, and each task is going to instantiate a subtopology, and it's going to deal with a single input partition for each topic which we have. So we can see this here. We have Kafka topic A with two partitions, Kafka topic B with two partitions. So we get two tasks and data from um, topic partition A0 and B0 is going to go to the first task from A1 and B1 is going to, do, going to go to the second task. So it allows us to do joins basically locally, so to say, right, on the task itself. So, and this assignment from input partitions to task is never changing. So one task is always going to be responsible no matter where it runs for a single input partition there. So that also means if we want to join data from two topics, we have to make sure that they have the same number of input partitions, right? Because otherwise we couldn't really match them up. Now, if we change the key as we did before, right? We're actually not sure what was the key before, but we set the key to be the word we are looking at. What happens? Well, I think those of you who attended Olena's talk from Monday know that in Kafka, by default, the partition is determined by hashing, by serializing, hashing the key. So if we now change the key, basically, well, it would, the record is going to move to another topic, partition, so to say, which also means another task would be responsible for it. Now, this other task could run on a different Kafka Streams instance. So somehow these Kafka Streams instances would have to communicate. Well, we don't really want to have, uh, have them communicate directly. Instead, we have them communicate via a Kafka topic, so to say. So 
And well, I think this kind of processing step is pretty pretty standard, right? Spark does it as a shuffle. And basically here in Kafka Streams, our shuffling operations is done via this repartitioning topics. So now, since so what does it mean basically? It means since um, we have here in this case two subpartitions, so, sorry, two subtopologies, the second one because we had to do this rekeying, which might lead to repartitioning. Um, we actually have 12 tasks here if you have six input partitions. So quite a lot of streaming tasks, so to say. So now inside our inside our uh, JVM instance, we can have more than one streaming threads. Default is one, no? but typically it's a good practice to set a little bit higher. What's then going to happen is we are going to load balance, so to say, the task which we have to deal with on this instance between the different threads. So here in this case, we have three tasks and two threads, which means, well, one thread has to deal with two tasks, the other one with one task. No? And another way how we can basically scale them out is you know, if we add a second instance here with a single thread in this case, well, no, automatically, so to say, Kafka would again, based on the consumer group protocol, distribute the task between the two instances. Good. Um, what's the difference? Okay. So, um, now, Important is the state stores, which we just talked about. They're always local to the tasks. So if, for instance, you have a stateful streaming application with two stateful operations and six input partitions, you will have 12 state stores running around. There's a reason why we do this. No, one, I would say, okay, RocksDB is a pretty lightweight data store. Uh, on the other hand, this really gives us freedom to move the task from one compute instance to the other one easily. Now, if we somehow would group these different uh, states for different tasks together, moving them easily would not be possible. Okay, good. So this was a really quick whirlwind tour about Kafka Streams application. And I know if you have not worked with Kafka Streams before, this might be, might be a little quick, but I think we somehow need to understand why we need to make the recommendations we, we are going to make to get a production-ready Kafka Streams application. So what does production-ready mean? Well, I would say we we should think about at least four four dimensions, so to say. Actually, there are a little more, right? So we, we need to be able to test our code somewhere before we move to production, hopefully. We should be able to scale our code. No, that might might mean scaling out, must might just mean tuning it in a certain way, right? With the same hardware to, to handle increased load. We should be able to observe our code and to get some understanding of what it's doing and be able to debug it also. And then finally, we should be able to ensure high availability. So if one machine is crashing, compute or our Kafka Streams application should still run. And you can think about more dimensions, so to say, what it means to be production ready. And I had a couple more, but I had to cancel them due to time reasons. So let's look at test first. And I mean, really, don't be that guy, okay? Please, no? So don't just test in production. Now, the question is, if we have this kind of um, data flow graph, how can we actually test, test it there, right? Because, I mean, we, we build up a pathology and then, well, yeah, how, how can, can we get data in? And I think we have three good practices for that one. First one, I mean, we just saw a very simple lambda, and what I see often when I review code is, you see this kind of lambda, you know, like 20 line lambdas for the business logic, don't do that, okay? So, no. If you have this kind of long lambda, nothing. Of course, it's not really Kafka stream specific, you know. Like, put it into a method, you know. Give it a good name. Be happy that you solved one important computer science problem, namely naming things, you no, know, and write a test for it or a couple of tests, right? And this also allows you later on to scale easily because at some point your topology might evolve to have multiple input topics, and then if can you really be sure you have well, matched all kind of topic possible into, uh, input history, so to say. It's going to be really, really difficult to do this on this level. A second one is a tool, which we call the topology test driver, which you can basically use to take your data flow and test it inside a unit test without a, without a running Kafka cluster. So what you basically do is you, you create a couple of input topics, you pipe data into the input topics, you create output topics, and you can then assert the data in the input topics by treating them as a list, basically. 
And the second one, which we found very useful, is to use test containers. I'm not sure if that's familiar or if you're familiar with that one. Basically, that's the kind of tooling, you know, which allows you to spin up basically a Docker Compose environment. You can think about this like this from a Java unit test. This is pretty useful. And we, we, there are also some wrappers which allow you to easily spin up a Kafka cluster in a couple of lines. And it's going to take a couple of seconds. Um, but you really have a full-blown, let's say, production-ready Kafka cluster then um, to test your application against. So let's look at the second dimension, scale, so to say. No? So I think one very important pattern is try to keep the number of subtopologies low. Right? Because we saw before, whenever we have a different subtopology, we have a round trip to Kafka. Right? So we have net, no, and again, this is similar to, let's say, old Spark jobs, or no, where we have narrow and wide transformations, maybe. No, so we try to limit the number of wide transformations we use. No? so basically, one way of doing that is realizing that each time the record key changes, the partition might change. We need a repartitioning topic. We need the Kafka round trip. So try to set a good key, business relevant key from the get-go in your topic, and otherwise try to reorganize your code so that repartition or to, uh, repartitioning, sorry, rekeying is not necessary very often. So, if you know the key doesn't change, um, we can have, a, we can use a specific method, and that's why something like map comes actually in pairs. We have map and map values. Map can change both key and value. Map values can only change the value. So Kafka streams know we don't need to repartition. We also have the same thing for flat map. And we can compare the two topologies, right? On the left-hand side, we have used map or flat map. No? So we need to have this repartitioning step, network round trip to Kafka. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we realized, oh, we can actually write it using map values, and we saved this one, this round trip. Actually, there's a second thing. If we do this kind of round trip, we have to do a little bit more because well, we have to serialize our value first to write to Kafka and we have to deserialize it again, of course, you know, when we read from the um, repartition topic. And another really important thing is try to think ab about your serialization format you're going to use. Um, typically, I would recommend using Avro or Protobuf, depending on what you're more familiar with over JSON for this kind of thing, because it gives you faster, typically faster deserialization and serialization, which is also very useful because we have to serialize at many, many steps. You know, think about each time when we write to the RocksDB, that's also outside of the JVM, so we have to call the serializer or deserializer again to, to get the data you know, from JVM to, to the storage format. So it is not uncommon if you really look with a profile at Kafka Stream application that we are going to spend a huge chunk of our time on serializing, deserializing data. So try to make choose as, uh, the most efficient serialization as you can. And um, it also makes sense to use something like a schema registry rather than topic schemas. By that I mean we basically have a fixed mapping from a topic to a schema um, well, in order to be able to evolve your data there if we talk about this one. Um, and it's also, think about, I mean, if we, if we have the schema hard-coded inside, inside the application logic, it is also difficult to onboard a new consumer because they first need to be able to understand the schema of the data and get it from somewhere. Also, using a schema registry is really useful here. So another important thing is not to forget, well, inside the Kafka Stream application, we have a consumer and a producer. Now, this is really Z plain vanilla Java client. So we can also access all the, config the configuration parameters, similar to how we could configure a normal producer, and we should make use of that. Right? So I think one of the most important optimizations um, for a Kafka producer is batching together with compression. Right? So we try to you know, not send every message as a single request to the Kafka broker, we try to batch them together, and these batches we can also compress. This is handled completely transparently by the client libraries for us. Um, so, if you have a, want to get your Kafka Streams application production ready, make sure you play with different batching options. These are controlled by batch size in LingMS, and also you know, evaluate which um, compression algorithm gives you the best result. 
So typically, I would start with that standard. Um, sometimes, if this gives us very high CPU load, it might make um, might make sense to go to LZ4, which is slightly less CPU intensive. Typically, I must say, no, we should really try this out. And if this doesn't work, use Snappy, no, which is gives typically gives the lowest compression but least CPU um, impact. And this is going to help. Typically, it's going to help you to, uh, tremendously with the Kafka Streams app. Um, uh, performance. Now, in older Kafka versions, um, we should also make sure that you set acknowledgements and uh, mini sync replicas to make sure that you have a decent uh, or durable storage inside Kafka, because Kafka relies on replication. Now, modern um, client versions should do this automatically for us. Good. So another thing which is very important here, try to use for stateful Kafka Streams application. Stateless, it doesn't really matter because the only thing which you're going to write is application logs, which hopefully we are writing out somewhere, right? But, but for a stateful application, try to use as the fastest uh, storage medium possible, so to say. It really pays off there. I had a customer who was very, how to say, unhappy with Kafka Streams performance. No, uh, because they want to deploy everything on AWS Fargate, which doesn't really offer a lot of IOPS, so to say. And uh, so there are a lot of complaining that basically Kafka Stream is never going to work once we move to a decent ECA, ECS, yeah, ECS instance, basically. You know, all the problems disappeared. So this is also very important, especially for stateful apps. Good. So another thing we just before, we talked about this automatic distribution of uh, tasks to Kafka Streams. So uh, one very important thing to control is, is num stream thread, the config, because by default this is one. So if you bring up one Kafka Streams application on the big VM, let's say with 12 cores, we are only going to use one basically. You know? So set this one to the number of cores. Um, and then of course, you know, if, if we have too many, you know, we have a lot of some idle tasks there. Good. So this basically concludes the scale or performance aspect, which we should understand or know for Kafka Streams. Let's look at the observe aspect. So first of all, well, like all Kafka components, I would say, or Ultra, we can use JMX metrics to monitor. And we don't have time to look into detail here, but I would say these are more or less the most important JMX metrics to monitor. Um, you have, again, hundreds, no, and basically you can get some on the st uh, per state store level, so it is quite a lot. Um, but to get them, it's important to set the metrics recording level uh, from the default info to debug. Not only then you're going to get task level metrics and also state store level metrics there. Okay, so another thing, um, I mean, make sure to use some form of log aggregation. I mean, I, I would say, you know, big part of our customers don't have this implemented. And then you know, as soon as you have six, 12 different Kafka streaming instances and you try to really understand what's going on in case of an outage, you're in hell, basically. No? So make sure you aggregate your logs. Again, this is nothing Kafka stream specific, right? But um, I, I spend a lot of time in my professional life, you know, where this, this might have helped. Another thing which is going to help us with debugging and also if we have to evolve our Kafka Streams application is actually naming the processing steps. Um, so if you can basically see here, um, by default, you now these processing steps and the topology and also internal topics are going to be called car stream operation and then some number, you know, counting up. Now we have the possibility to name all of those this is very important because, well, it doesn't just refer to the processing steps, but also to state stores and internal topics. So if, for instance, we have an internal topic, which was at position 17, and then we rewrite our application, so the internal topic goes to position 12, I mean, well, all things can break loose, right? I mean, especially if there was a internal topic with position 12 before, because Kafka Streams cannot check this one. Right, so then basically it's going to read the old data and assume this is going to be the, the new data, so to say. So if you want to have a, also a Kafka Streams application which you can involve, you know, naming your processing steps is vital. But honestly, it, it clutters the code quite a lot. 
Um, okay, good. So, last part of our talk is ensuring high availability. And of course, on a simple level, that just means try to start more than, uh, or try to run more than one application instance from the get-go, you know, two or more. You know. And then again, our front, the consumer group protocol is going to help us if one application instance fails. The task of the failed instance are going to automatically migrate to the still running application instance. So how does this look like, basically? Well, I said before, no, we have the stream processing node here, oh sorry, no, which I'm going to write to the change log topic, and if I have my failover processing node here, it's going to read from the change log topic, and then finally, um, once this has been consumed completely, he's ready to, to process again. Now, of course, there's the problem because the change log topic it is compacted, but it can be pretty huge, right? I mean, there's some deduplication going on before we write out to the change log topic, but still think about if you have a very big stateful application, you know, where the state is maybe a couple of gigabytes, we first have to read this couple or hundreds of gigabytes, and we first have to read all this in, so we have the actual state before we can continue to process. And often, um, we, we might know, you know, that the rebalancing takes a little bit of time, but for Kafka streaming application, most likely the biggest time which we need for rebalancing is going to be taken by reading the state again. Now, we have one um, setting there, and this is num standby replica is one concept. So what's the standby replica? Well, standby replica is going to basically have one topic, one stateful um, partitioning task assigned to it, and it's going to read the change log topic continuously and just keep its local state so up to date. So it's not going to actually itself produce records, it's just going to read the change log topic and iterate the local state store. So what happens if we fail over, you know, because the active instance fails? Well, the Kafka Consume Protocol knows about the existence of the standby replica and is going to move the task to the node where the standby replica is running. So we have almost instantaneous failover. Um, and I think, especially if we have a huge or large um, state set, so to say, this is a very important setting to in uh, ensure HA. So, um, another thing which is often overlooked is that besides the JVM, and typically Kafka streams, depends of course what we do, but is rather, it's not very JVM memory hungry, but each of the um, RocksDB instances is going to have a certain overhead of about 100 megabyte. We can tune this, and actually it's um, 98 megabyte. And as we said before, you know, so if we have stamper replicas plus a lot of tasks, because we have a lot of input partitions, think about 200 input partitions, right? We already need almost 20 gigabyte just for this kind of state store overhead. This is something to keep in mind when we size our application. Otherwise, sizing this application in terms of RAM is a little difficult because we, well, what I think it's clear what we should do. We should try to keep the hot set of the keys in memory. And then, of course, this depends how many keys are in the hot set, how big are the messages. Um, maybe that's a good topic for the next talk. Good. Okay. And basically, the last two things here which we have to do is, uh, which also often overlooked is, we have basically two steps where we can actually um, have a problem. One is deserializing the records, the other one is producing records to Kafka. Plus, of course, we, exceptions could occur inside our own business logic. Now, if exceptions occur inside our business logic, it is our own, so developers' uh, responsibility to handle them. Um, by default, but if in this interface to the external world steps, you no know, deserializing messages or writing messages to Kafka, exceptions occur, the Kafka Streams application is going to crash, or actually, the stream thread is going to crash. Now, if you really um, need to have very consistent message processing, this might be the right thing to do, but sometimes you could say, okay, well, if there's one ill-formatted messages which I cannot deserialize, I should just go on. Now, this we can configure by setting the uh, default deserialization exception handler to lock and continue, oh, something like this. Um, and similar for the production exception handler. So in one final 
tip, so to say, to get a production-ready Kafka Streams application, which is very important. That's why I put it in the end. But it's also an open forgot. M be sure to add this kind of shutdown hook, because when your application gets a sick term or something like this, without the shutdown hook, it might not properly um, clean up the state stores and uh, make sure that well, all iterators are closed and messages are flushed to change log topics and output topics. So this basically concludes um, well, my, my short presentation for today. Thanks all for the uh, attention. And do we have any questions? I think we have four minutes, right? Yeah, thanks, Christoph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we still have time for questions. Any? Oh, I see one in the back. I'll be right there. Hi. Um, Hi. How would you handle failed transformations? So you mentioned exception handl handlers for Saturday, but how would you handle failed transformations? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I see. So basically, we have another setting here which is not configurable. Now we all can also have a oh, what's the name uh, processing exception handler which we can set and there you have the basically have the opportunity to say okay we just continue basically we are going to restart the, uh, the streaming thread or we are going to shut down the application uh, typically i would really say okay make really sure you know that your business logic is sound and you don't pop out any ex any exceptions or you no know, and if you need really consistent message processing right because every message so to say count um, maybe because you have to aggregate complex states to do transaction processing, then maybe shutting down the streaming application and having somebody investigate why this message is there and what is the impact is the right way to doing it. Yep. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes, we have one more. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding race conditions because uh, in the past I've sometimes heard it hard to reason about possible race conditions that can come on these streaming systems that then mm -hmm. hold state. And if I understood you correctly, when you have multiple tasks and you're updating the state store, you update the local RocksDB and then eventually flush to the to the Kafka topic that then mm -hmm. eventually updates the uh, the state in the other tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, does this create uh, the possibility to have race conditions in in apps or in uh, applications when used improperly? Or like, are there anti patterns in using? Uh, Kafka streams that could introduce race conditions because of this eventual consistency? Um, so normally I would not be concerned about race conditions then, because I mean, as soon as, as our application instance is live, you know, we, we, have a, we have a sound, so to say, um, sound state, you know, even if it has not been flushed to the Kafka, or maybe we have to retry flushing to the change log topic. Now, then what we do is basically if if we have update to the change log topic and we have, um, sorry, we are not going to commit, so to say, the offset, which is going to be read from the Kafka Streams application until the offset, the update to the change log topic has been successful. So, which means if there is some failure in the local state, we are going to reprocess the message again. Then, um, yeah. So, typically, what you can see is you can see this multiple updates. Maybe, you know, so um, what we have in Kafka streams, we have the possibility to use um, exactly one semantics, which should be race condition free. So the way exactly one semantics works in Kafka streams is, I mean, think about, is that we use um, transactions of which allow us to have some kind of atomic commit or atomic operation over different top, uh, Kafka topic partitions. And I mean, think about, I said, Kafka streams application should not try to access the external world, you know, like talk to an external system, I mean, besides RocksDB and Kafka, of course. 
So the, the effect, so to say, is, go is what? It's going to be the output topics, it's going to be the change log topics, and it's going to be, well, committing an offset to the consumer offsets topic. Now, what Kafka Stream Sync can do, or what you could do also by hand, but I've never seen anybody implement it successfully, is take the three updates to the topic in one transaction, and then either one fails or the other, and then if you basically rebuild your state um, with a failed instance, you're going to start by, or stop at a, the last closed transaction, so to say. So it should be race condition free. Of course, bugs can occur. And uh, we, we, then, but typically you don't have race conditions there. Yeah. Helps. Otherwise, let's talk outside. I think we are almost out of time. Yeah. Let's uh, thank Christoph once again um, for the great talk and Q&A.